The week between Christmas and New Year's for our family is a flurry of gatherings, as it is for many. We gather with Sarah's mom's side and then with my parents and with Sarah's dad's side, dad's side of the family over New Year's. It's a week of chips and cheese and cookies and driving and family and then more chips and cheese and cookies. Well, my father-in-law's gathering, I'm always excited to catch up with him, Roger, Sarah's dad, because he always has exciting things that he's doing, or some crazy adventures to share. So this week we talked of his chestnut farm that is that yielded 50 pounds this year and is well on its way to his goal of 10 to 20,000 pounds a year. So that was interesting. We talked trees, farming, politics, churches. And I've found it rather encouraging that we vote for different candidates. We go to different churches. He's evangelical and I'm a mainliner, but we find lots to talk about and lots of common ground and have grown in respect for one another over the years. Well, at last year's Christmas gathering, Roger told me he was reading everything he could find by a guy named Watchman Nee, and he was currently reading his book titled Sit, Walk, Stand. Watchman Nee was a Chinese man who started 200 churches in China from 1923 to 1950 or 52 or so, and um, then he was thrown in prison by the communist government there until his death in 1972, and um, the charges seem to be false. And currently, the Christian faith is grown, growing faster than anywhere in China, and the growth is in many ways due to Watchman Nee and his work. Because he's a very courageous man, a very um, skilled Christian leader, and these churches were started in small rented homes, and they grew rapidly, both numerically and spiritually. Well, I knew there would be places where Mr. Nee and I wouldn't agree, but I told Roger that I would love to read his book, and sure enough, Santa got me a fresh copy this year for Christmas. I've come to believe that evangelicals and mainliners need one another. We have a lot to learn from one another, a few things to teach one another. Now, not many evangelicals would agree with me on this, but we, as mainliners, have some things to teach them about the Bible. I know that's surprising since they're supposed to be the Bible people, but we have a better understanding of the values of the whole of the Bible, a more accurate understanding. Justice for the poor, serving the poor, welcoming the outcasts. We understand that the realm of God is a vision for a new world, the whole of life, how we can live it together with one another. I'm not saying that we necessarily know how to live all this out. I'm just saying that we can offer that to the conversation. And evangelicals can teach us many things, many things. It seems like they can teach us just about everything. They can teach us how to invite others into the faith and how to help them grow once they get there. But centrally, they can teach us that the values of the faith, these realm of God values, must be rooted in our relationship with God. They must be rooted in a relationship with God. Now, I wouldn't have used that word relationship five years ago. It was too evangelical. It was too personal. It seemed to take me someplace my faith didn't go. But I use relationship now, and I think we need to reclaim it. We need to be able to talk about our personal experience with the holy, with holy mystery, with holy love, with unearned gift and grace, our experience with this, our life with this. This is, this is God. This is God. And we need to seek God out and spend time attentive to God, with God, as we would in any relationship. Our values and our servant actions must flow out of a growing awareness of the presence of God in our lives and in the world. And evangelicals can teach us this. The Christian faith is first and foremost about God. Everything is dependent upon the grace of God. In the world, the church, our lives. And we flounder when we lose sight of this fact as churches, as individuals. And we grow, as we grow into this, we mature and deepen as people, as Christians, especially as Christian communities. So I sat down to read my new Christmas book, Sit, Walk, Stand, the Process of Christian Maturity is the subtitle by Watchman Nee. As you may have guessed, Nee says that the secret to the Christian life is as simple as sitting, walking, standing. I have to confess I've only read the first part, so I only know how to sit. <laughs> but it was good, the section, and I wanted to share some of it with you. The first part of the book is really the first part of the story of baptism, of water, the river, Christ's baptism, our own baptism, it's an invitation to live a life rooted in God that gives us the strength and the courage 
to walk this different way of love. And he writes this, Christianity does not begin with walking, it begins with sitting. Our natural reason says if we do not walk, how will we ever reach the goal? How can we ever get anywhere if we do not move? And I think that describes our feelings as Americans, especially with our work ethic and our national myth that what we really need is earned, never given. And he continues, though. But Christianity is a queer business, he says. If at the outset we try to do anything, we gain nothing. If we seek to attain something, we miss everything. For Christianity begins not with a big do, but a big done. The Christian life from start to finish is based upon this principle of utter dependence upon God. There is no limit to God's grace, but we receive it when we rest in God. And sitting is an attitude of rest. It's paradoxical but true. We only advance in the Christian life as we learn, first of all, to sit down. This is not a command to sit down, but to see ourselves as seated in Christ, as resting in God. Our Christian life begins with the discovery of all that God has already done for us. And he says, that's the big done, the realization, what God has already given us. Over the years, I've emphasized, the many years that I've been a pastor, I've emphasized that Jesus' baptism is the starting gun for his ministry. Bang, there he goes, he's off with baptism. And it's the beginning of our ministry too. Baptism charts our course, it gives us our job. We're to share in Christ's ministry. But it's easy for us to skip too quickly to what we are to do and neglect to recognize what has already been done, what has been given us. Thanks to Watchman Nee's encouragement to sit, I noticed something about Luke's baptism story that I think I would have missed otherwise. When the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends in bodily form like a dove and the voice says, You are my son, the beloved with you, I'm well pleased. Jesus is sitting. He's come out of the river and he's sitting. He's praying. He's resting. Soon he will get up and walk and serve and work, but first he rests. First he rests in God's grace and love and all that that means. Soaks it in. As much as we are invited to serve and to walk first, we are invited to sit and rest and enjoy. God wants us to spend time sitting and resting. Our life isn't to be all striving and straining and scrambling. In baptism, we're given the title beloved. We are accepted as we are. We are valuable as we are. Now, how much time do we spend trying to earn someone else's acceptance? Think about it. Whose approval or even love are you trying to earn? Who are you trying to impress? Whose standards are you trying to meet? Your boss? Super cruel, trendy friends? Co-workers? Those neighbors who always seem a step ahead, who have it all and flaunt it and get under your skin? Your brother or sister who never listens to you? Who never expects you to have anything to say? Who barely notices you exist? Your parents, for whom nothing ever seems good enough. Your children, for whom nothing ever seems good enough. 